Father, that you're good and you're God. We thank you, Father God, for who you are, for what you do. Now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Move upon our lives, Father God. Bless us tonight that we will hear from you. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to teach us your word, that your word will be plain, that your word will be clear, that your word will be relevant. Father God, that your word will speak to us in such a way that we will be able to go with you as we make changes. So in the strong, mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. We're still experiencing God from experiencing God book. Some of you who were linked into our Zoom, please link into it again. Uh, we are on page number 23, page 23, experiencing God. He deals with the first reality. Matter of fact, tonight we deal with the first three realities. Experiencing God, the first, the first three, the first three realities. Yes? Yes. The first three realities. We we ended up last week talking about if you're going to go with God, you're going to have to make some changes. <laughs> if you're going to go with God, you're going to have to make some changes. You're going to have to make some changes in your life. And when we look at Exodus chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4, will somebody tell us what's going on? Give us a clear picture of what's going on. Exodus chapter 2, 3, and 4. Exodus chapter 2, 3, and 4. There's a man there that's middle age, as they would put it. Who's the character? Exodus chapter 2. Moses. Moses. The, the Mo, Moses himself is the character. Who's another character in, in Exodus chapter 2, 3, and 4? Jacob. Um, God. God, right? God. God is the, the other the other person. Sister Davis, you got the microphone. Answer those chapter two, chapter three, and chapter four. Answer those chapter two, three, and four. And God is the character there, and Moses is the other character. Yes? Yes. God is the character and Moses is the other character. What's going on there? What's Tell me, what's, what's another character, a, uh, a person, a, a thing that's not a person? Who's the character there? What's the other thing that's, that's in that text that's not a person? In Exodus chapter 2, Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 4, there's a thing there that's not a person. The burning bush. There's a bush burning. There's the bush is on fire. The bush is burning. So tell me what's going on in Exodus chapter 2, Exodus chapter 3, and Exodus chapter 4. In Exodus chapter 2, Moses, Moses is being born. And uh, who issued a decree to Pharaoh that to kill all the war babies. And um, Moses is in the, his mother placed him in the river. Mm -hmm. And his, his sister was watching. And Pharaoh's um, uh, sister daughter, Pharaoh's daughter, help me out, Pharaoh's daughter uh, saw the baby crying and then the sister came and asked if she could go get uh, a Hebrew mother to nurse the baby and uh, 
she went and got Moses' mother and she nursed Moses and then she gave the baby, gave Moses to Pharaoh's daughter. I get mixed up. Okay, I think that's it. You not only got mixed up, you mixed us up. <laughs> well, that's the gist of kind of like the story. Okay, so, so Moses Moses. So Pharaoh wants these babies dead. Why does he want them dead? Brother Mark. Because the Israelites because the Israelites were multiplying in great numbers and they were fearful that the Israelites would take over Egypt. Okay, because the Israelites were multiplying in great numbers, so the Pharaoh, what's the Pharaoh, Brother Miles? What, how do we relate the Pharaoh today and today's turn? What's the Pharaoh? Pharaoh would be the king of Egypt. He's the king. So what do we have that represents who Pharaoh is today? Uh, the, in the United States, the president. The president, right? The president in other places, the prime minister. So here it is. Pharaoh is saying, hey, these babies are being born. Why did he choose, Brother Whitlock? Why did he choose boy babies? Oh, boy. Why is everybody always picking on boy babies? Hey, boy babies. <laughs> well, because it is, it is the men who will create the families. Okay. And women create families. Men and women, right? But, it, but they distinctively, and when you look at, at Jesus being born, he, um, Herod is getting rid of a boy child. Why is the boy child so important? And when you have an enemy, why is the boy child so important to get rid of? Okay, everybody? The males are the ones who fight usually. Okay, come on, give past the mic. So, so it is true that the, the men create families. Men create families, yes, yes ma'am. There's an enemy, usually it's the men who's the one. Okay, men are the ones who are the stronger when it comes to fighting, right? So we have two reasons why he got to get rid of them, right? So why was Jesus one of the targets of Herod? Why was Jesus? Now we're in the New Testament. We just moved from Old Testament to New Testament, right? So so we're talking about Jesus now. Jesus in the New Testament. Moses in the Old Testament. So why was it important that that, that uh, Herod, King Herod, Brother Miles said King, Pharaoh, similar in leadership. Why was it necessary for Herod, King Herod, to get rid of Jesus? Who has your hand up? Brother Miles, Brother Miles. Why was it necessary for Herod to get rid of Jesus? Because it was told to him that a king was born and a king would be a male, and he didn't want there to be any rival king around other than himself. Okay, so he's territorial. He's making sure that I'm going to be the king on the throne, throne when this thing comes out. We want to make sure that babies are not born that were possibly king. He heard that Jesus was going to possibly be the king, but did he really know what type of king Jesus was going to be? He didn't care. He did not. He did not. So what's the difference in his kingdom and Jesus' kingdom? Who else talking? Okay, Brother Miles, you got the mic. <laughs> uh, Jesus' kingdom would be a spiritual kingdom. Uh, okay. Not only did Herod not know, but <laughs> the rest of the people did not know as well. Okay. So they, they wanted to make him a, a physical king, king or a governmental king. But he came to rule from a spiritual standpoint. Let's go back to Exodus. So Exodus chapter 2, we see uh, that, that Pharaoh wanted these babies, babies killed, the, more, the boy babies. So his mama, Moses' mama, put him in what is known as bull rush and let him and flow down the river. What river was that? The Nile River, right? He floating down the river and the, the, uh, the Pharaoh's... Um, Daughter is bathing. She hears this baby crying, and God gives her compassion for for Israelite baby. She has compassion. So, who, who was watching? 
Moses' sister, right? Her name is Miriam, right? Remember Miriam, when they came out of Egypt, Miriam played the tamarind. The Miriam played the tamarind. This is, is Moses' sister. So she runs and gets a gets a a uh, Israelite woman, right? Why does she run and get this particular woman? It's the mother. It was the mother of Moses, the mother of the baby, right? Mm -hmm. So he she goes and gets um, Moses' mother, and let me tell you how God set things up. Mm -hmm. It is amazing how God, in His infinite wisdom will set things up when Moses is supposed to have died, his mama nursed him and Pharaoh's daughter protected him. Are you with me? God has such great wisdom until he is able to put some blessings and some people in your way that will keep you when you're supposed to be dead. Any witnesses? When you're supposed to be a victim, God will make you a victorious person. Isn't that awesome? Nobody can do it like God can. Babies being killed all around, Moses being saved because he's being saved for a godly purpose. What happens in Exodus chapter 3? Anybody got any cliff notes? Cliff notes. What happens? Exodus chapters 3 and 4. You can give me all of it at one time. One. Exodus chapter 3 and 4, something else happens. That's when uh, Moses went up to the mountain, and then uh, they found, that's when he met his wife. And uh, they, took, uh, they took him, the women took him to meet her father, and then Okay, so in chapter 2, he meets the Torah. Right, let's go to chapter 3. In chapter 3, Moses gets in touch with this burning bush. He comes to the burning bush. Why is this burning bush important? Bushes burn all the time, right? Number one, why was it important? Number two, what was unique about this bush? Number three, what happened at the bush? Number one, why is this bush important? Who has the mic? Pass the mic, please. Pass the mic. Pass the mic. Pass the mic to somebody who don't want to look at you and don't want you to give them mic. Okay, why is this bush important? It wasn't being burned up. You used the mic. So, the bush is important. Why is the bush important? Why is the bush important? The bush was not burning up. It wasn't being consumed. Okay, that's what makes the bush unique. It was burning, but it wasn't being consumed. The lady behind you wants the mic. Yes, that lady. All right. What's another thing about this bush? It was to get his attention. It was to get his attention. So all these bush could be burning, but this one bush gets his attention. God has a way of getting your attention. Even when you don't know God's getting your attention. How many people have had some burning bushes experience where God got your attention? In the 21st century, sometimes God has to get our attention with tragedy. But not necessarily always. God wants to get your attention without taking you through stuff. God wants to get your attention. How many people in the room, God has gotten your attention? The song says, God is trying to tell you something. Who wants to share that time that God got their attention? Anybody? Who wants to share? All right. I'll say that when God got my attention, I you, you need to use the mic, right? Okay. Good Please use the mic. Okay. God got my attention. If you're just talking of personally, I I had three reds, and each one I was saved, but I was already. I mean. I was already saved and in God's and dwelling within God's word. But after those three wrecks, each one I was saved. They were devastating. That's when God got my attention to know that um, 
uh, that he brought me through, it was for a purpose. And that was a purpose for me to grow closer to him and uh, for myself to lean not onto my own understanding of things. Okay. So God God has a way of getting your attention. Sometimes he gets your attention through tragedy. The author has already said God can get your attention through the word of God. God gets our attention through the Bible. God gets our attention through circumstances. God gets our attention through the through the preaching and teaching of the word. You don't have to always have a tragedy, but some of us have to have things happen to us for God to get our attention. So God gets his attention. The burning bush is burning. It's a unique burning. Why was it a unique burning? Why was it a unique burning? Just a bush burning, right? Well, what was unique about this burning of this bush? Who's talking? Raise your hand in the air. Wave them. Why, what is unique about this burning? This burning, that burning bush is, uh, I mean, it encompassed, but nothing else was burning around it. Okay, but, uh, and it was sacred because uh, Moses had to take off. God told them, you need to take your shoes off and prepare, and that's where the Ten Commandments came. Okay, so is it at this bush, though, that, that, that all this happened? All this didn't happen right there at that bush though, right? God is only calling him at this point. God is getting his attention. And so the burning bush is burning, but the key is it's not being consumed. It's not being burned up. It's burning, but it keeps right on burning. Okay, who asked me? I was your number one. God was already at work around Moses. And the idea is to know that God is at work around us. God is already at work. Yes, ma'am. Reality. Reality. Turn, turn the microphone, right please. Oh. Oh, okay. Reality one. God was already at work around Moses. The Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor. They cried out, and their cry for help because of the difficult labor ascended. To God. God heard them groaning, groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the Israelite and God's love. Exodus 2 23 2 through 25. Okay, so Exodus 2 23 2 through 25 explains to us that God saw them and he heard them. Not only did he see them and hear them, he also knew them. God knows you. He knows what you're going through. When, when someone knows you, this is talking about knowing you in an intimate way. A very intimate way. So it, so it says that God remembered the covenant that he gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That I'm going to bless the people through you, through your seed. And when I bless the people through you, I'm going to bless so many people, you can't even count them. They're going to be like the stars in the sky, and they're going to be like the sand of grain on the seashore. Number two, reality number two. Reality number two. It would be good if you keep the mic on and, and just, well, unless you're going to cuss. <laughs> Reality two. God pursued a continuing love relationship with Moses that was real and personal. Moses was a murderer, yet God took the initiative to come to Moses and initiate a love relationship with him. God told Moses he would go with him into Egypt. Many texts throughout Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy illustrate the way God pursued a love relationship with Moses. Here is one example. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and stay there so that I may give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandments. I have written for their instruction. When Moses went up to the mountain, the cloud covered it, 
the glory of the Lord settled on the Mount on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses from the cloud. Moses entered the cloud as he went up the mountain, and he remained on the mountain forty days and forty nights. Exodus twenty-four and twelve, fifteen through sixteen and eighteen. Amen. So God is pursuing a continuing love relationship with you. God wants a continual love relationship with you, one that is real and one that is personal. How do we know that? God uses Moses as the example. God is continually pursuing. Look at this. The God of the universe, the God of all love, God himself is pursuing a loving relationship with you. That is powerful. God is looking to you to love you. That ought to short circuit every person who considering suicide. God is pursuing a love relationship. with People say they, they try to do suicide because they don't feel loved. But let me just share with you, God loves you. He loves you just the way you are. God loves you so much until he's constantly running in pursuing a relationship <coughs> with you. It is in the, the small term. This is a very small term when you compare what God is doing for us. It is the boy that runs when the door, when the bell rings at school to get her books and carry it to her locker. She didn't want to have anything to do with him because she's looking at Jeff. <laughs> but he runs. I mean, he, he, he sits in the front seat at the door so he can run when the doorbell when the, when the school bell rings to change class so he can go to Elaine's house or Joanne's house or Jennifer's house or uh, a walker to her house or walker to her her next class he's running he's pursuing the word pursue means to hunt somebody down god is hunting you down god is pursuing a love relation to you, and it's a continual pursuing that he can give you everlasting love. Not only do people don't want what God has, but they push God away when he comes. Not all of us, not all the time. Some of us know that God is loving on us and we want God to love on us. But many times, people who don't feel love don't know how to, how to identify love when it comes. The wise writer said there are, four, there, there are four things I don't understand. He says he doesn't understand a, a snake on a rock. He doesn't know how the snake can stay on the side of the rock. He doesn't understand a ship at sea. He doesn't understand a, a eagle in the air, how the eagle can fly and soar. Look the sun dead in his eye and never flinch. Look at the sun eye to eye and never flinch. He says the fourth thing that he doesn't understand is a woman who has not been in love because she doesn't know how to handle it when love comes along. It's, when, it's, it's the idea of us not knowing how to handle God's love when God's love is pursuing us. God's love is running after us. In, 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 in Proverbs 8, it says that, that, that wisdom is crying in the street. Wisdom is running after us. God is pursuing us. He shut down stuff to get to us. God is, is running to pursue you. You're on your way out the door and you haven't done your morning devotion. God said, wait a minute, I'm here. <laughs> when you want to watch the news instead of watch what God has to say, instead of spending time with God, God said, I'm here for you. 
Don't ignore me. How often have we thought we needed to go right then and we didn't have time for God? And check this out. When we left early so we can get there early, then the train sits on the track for 20 minutes. And we could have spent that 10 minutes alone with God. God is trying to get our attention. You said that the burning bush is burning and it's not being consumed because it's getting men, women, boys, and girls' attention. What, what does God have to do to get your attention? How does God handle his pursuit of you to get your attention? I'm too busy. I got this thing going on with my family. I got these things going on at home. God, I'm too busy to read your word. God is running after us. He's pursuing us. God is madly in love with us. God wants us to stop for a moment just to spend some time. Have you ever been so busy you didn't have time to read? You didn't have time to study? We always leave there with intangible blessings and we leave with tangible blessings. You look at Acts chapters 4 and 5, they, they were telling the, the apostles to never teach or preach in the name of Jesus again. They asked the question, shall we obey man or shall we obey God? Finally, the prophet Gamaliel says, leave these men alone. He says, I can tell, and the people said, we can tell that they have spent time with God. They are not, they are not educated. They hadn't gone to seminary. But we can tell they have spent time alone with God. Gamaliel says, leave them alone. He says, leave them alone because if it's not of God, it's going to come to naught. But if it's of God, you can't stop. When God is blessing, when God is speaking, when God is moving, it's like a bullet train coming through. You got some choices to make. You can get on it and ride it. You can step out the way or let it go through. Or finally, you can stand in front of it, try to stop it, and get it run flat over. Gamera says, leave these men alone. If it's of God, you can't stop it. If it's not of God, it's going to shut down soon and very soon. God is pursuing a loving relationship with us. And he wants to love us over and over. He can love us better than anybody else can. That's right. God can love you better than any woman, any man, any child. Mm -hmm. God is pursuing you. And you say, I ain't got time. Ain't nobody got time for me. Mm -hmm. God is running after you. He, He's running after you. Jesus asked his disciples, do you just follow me for bread and for meat? For fish and loaves? God is pursuing us. He's, he's chasing after us. He's running after us just to show us how much he loves us. Isn't that awesome? That is pretty amazing. God is pursuing. Who has my And it doesn't matter. You need the mic. It doesn't matter what you have done or um, how bad you are. God still loves you because Moses was the murderer. Murderer. What do we do with murderers? Put them in jail. Put them in jail. Kill them back. And how do we feel? <laughs> Somebody said, kill them back. <laughs> how do we feel about murderers? Are they useless to us? Kill one of your loved ones, they're pretty useless to you is where, where we come to the conclusion of, realistically. But God uses somebody that's messed up already. A preacher get called to preach while he's standing there accepting his calling and making his announcement, folk in the audience saying, he was just a dope dealer last year. He was just a murderer. 
and then somebody get out of prison, they say, oh, he got jailhouse religion. He doesn't deserve to preach. I ain't even going down there. He can't tell me anything. But God, thank God you ain't God. Thank God that you are not God because God uses us when we messed up. God uses us when we are unworthy. I said a long time ago, and I don't know if I was even pastoring then, but people push pastors out of churches because of their sin. But the problem with that is, the jokers that's pushing them out, they are sinners. The number one reason why you should get rid of your pastor is if he's not teaching and preaching the word of God. Because you hired him to teach and to preach, or you, you elected him, or you selected him to teach and preach God's word. A famous person in, in our communities uh, was elected to a high-powered position. And once he got in that position, he continued to do what he was doing before he got in the position. Everybody knew he was doing what he was doing before he got in the position, but once he got to that level, they began to shun him, talk about him, and be disappointed with him. Mm. But he was doing the same thing in the other leadership role. Mm. And we still selected him. Mm. It wasn't a secret, but once he got on this level, we just can't put up with that. But if we, for right, we can't put up with it whether he has a leadership position or not. Because sin is sin. Yes, God holds those in leadership more accountable to a stricter punishment. That's why I tell you all the time, I take total responsibility even when I'm not here. It's, it's on me. Whatever happens, I can't control it. I can just pray about it. But at the end of the day, it's my responsibility to handle the outfall. To handle the fallout. To handle the tragedy. My responsibility. Take full responsibility. Whatever has happened, whatever will happen, I gotta deal with it. Because I'm, I'm in leadership. And real leaders take full responsibility. God takes a man that was a murderer and put him in a leadership position. And as you continue to read the book of Exodus, as you read from Exodus 2 all the way through Exodus uh, 30, you will find Moses, 32 I think, you will find Moses, this murderer chosen as the leader, he goes up and he complains to God. God said, what are you doing up here talking to me about them people? I call you. You get back down there and give them more instructions than what I said. <laughs> now Moses had nothing to do with building the golden calf. Mm -hmm. But God got on Moses. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. When they got to the Red Sea, the people complained. God dealt with Moses. Mm -hmm. The people say, let's go back. Moses says, stand still. God says, go forward. God take those who are not worthy and makes them worthy. And I'm so glad about it. Why do you think I'm glad about it? Because I realize and I confess I'm unworthy. Messed up then, messed up today. I'm just messed up. And y'all following somebody who messed up. My, my, my. Thank God for grace. Thank y'all for looking beyond my faults. Y'all look beyond my faults. If you did, God looks beyond my faults. And he sees our needs. A murderer. Somebody who killed somebody. And one Israelite said, you're going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian? 
So Moses takes off, goes to running, and when he goes to running, he runs to the bush. Reality number three. Reality number three. Reality number three. Reality three. God invited Moses to become involved with him in his work. I have come down to rescue them, the Israelites, from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good and spacious land. Therefore, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Exodus 3, 8, and 10. God uses this same murderer to go lead a whole nation out of slavery. A whole nation. Theologians believe it was around two million people that he got charge over. That he has responsibility <laughs> of. Bless you. Thank you. You have two million, if theologians are right, you have two million people yakking at him, complaining at him at the Red Sea. Two million people complaining at him when they get to the place called Mara, bitter water. Two million people saying, we want some food. We want meat this day. We want bread this day. And Moses, you got to get it because you brought us out here. God gives them food. Then they get thirsty. God gives them water. And Moses finally got a little attitude with him. Mm -hmm. What did Moses do when he got attitude with him? What did he do? Scrub the rock. God said, speak to this rock, and if you speak to this rock, then I'm going to give them fresh, cool water. Mm -hmm. Moses got an attitude. He got, he got sick and tired of him. He said, Lord, have mercy he talked to the Lord. The Lord gives him the answer. Then he goes and does what he wants to do. He does what he wants to do. He doesn't speak to the rock. He hits the rock. He strikes the rock. He didn't do it just the way God had said to do it either. He strikes it. He hits it. Sick and tired of being sick and tired. He just got tired. He strikes this rock, and guess what happens? The same water that God was going to give to them, if he had spoken to the rock, the water flowed out. Why God did that? Because he is a merciful God. That tells me that, that God will bless us. He will give us mercies, even when the leader messes up. Isn't that something? Even when the leader messes up, God was merciful to them. He gave them, gave them mercy. He gave them mercy. Number next. Let's look at the questions, number two, on page 23. Reality one. What was God, what was God already doing for Israel? What was God already doing for Israel? What was God already doing for Israel? We just read those two, three passages of Scripture. What was God already doing? He heard them groaning. He heard them crying in the midst of, of hard labor. They cried out. God was already making a plan to deliver them. God was preparing Moses even as he was murdering. I want to tell you, even while you're messing up, God is preparing a way for to be what he has called you to be. We have such a merciful God. Yes, right. such, a, such a gracious God. We have a God that looks beyond our thoughts. He sees the people needs. He sees our needs. And that God who sees our needs keeps right on blessing us. Right. Be aware of Romans 6 where Paul asked the question, Shall we continue in sin because grace abounds? No, not at all. Don't keep trying this thing. Don't keep trying God. Don't, don't keep bailing off into it. 
Because God is merciful. What was God already doing for Israel? He was preparing a way for their deliverance. Reality two. What evidence demonstrates God wanted a real and personal relationship with Moses. In other words, what demonstrates that God wants a personal and real relationship with you? What is it in reality, too, that God wants a personal, a real relationship with you? It says that God is constantly pursuing you. God is constantly looking at you. God is constantly looking for you. So what demonstrates that God is constantly looking and revealing himself and looking to Moses? Right there in the second pericope. It says, come up here on the mountain. Stay there that I may give you the stone tablets. When Moses went up the mountain, the cloud covered it. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses from the cloud. How many of you spent six days with God? How many of you spent six hours with God? How many of you spent six minutes with God? You know, there are, there are a bunch of self-help books out there and in these self-help books, they tell you how you can get along with God. Some of them say, just spend five minutes alone with God. Others say, spend 10 minutes alone with God. But let me just share with you. Sometimes you begin to spend time with God, you ought to get caught up with him until your time just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. That doesn't mean you lay there and go to sleep. It means spend quality, conscious, time. Be conscious about it. Be intentional about it. Spend quality time alone with him. Spend time alone. Quality time alone with God. Spend some time alone with God so that you can get to know him and he can get to know you. God is, is running after you. Moses entered the cloud, entered the cloud as it went up to the mountain. As it went up the mountain, he remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Good God Almighty. Now, God, you pushing it now. 40 days? How long is eternity compared to 40? There is no comparison. 40 days. People say stuff like, preacher, I got to work. I ain't got time for that. I got children to feed. Mm. Baby needs diapers. Mm. But what, what happened before you had all those responsibilities? Did you spend quality time alone with God? God wants us to spend quality time. The Bible said that, that the cloud was present, covered it for six days, and on the seventh day, God called Moses from the cloud and entered the, and Moses entered the cloud as he went up to the mountain, went up the mountain, and he remained on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, it didn't say that Moses went up there to stay up there 40 days and 40 nights, but when he got there, he spent time alone with God. How many of you went out of town to visit somebody and you only took three days of clothing with you? And all of a sudden, they ask you, well, don't you want to stay for a week? And because you love them so much and you want to spend some quiet time with them, you just stayed there for a week. I'm telling your parents know how to get you. If you don't come visit a lot, you say, so, Mom, mom made the statement, so you leaving too? Well, you know, it's time for everybody to leave. <laughs> but you leaving too? So guess who got stuck? You. Yeah, mama, I, I'll be here. 
And it ought to be a joyous occasion to spend time with God. You ought to love spend, you ought to love the time you spend with your almighty God. I ought to get excited about it. Reality three. How did God involve Moses in the work he was already done, doing? We, we have already declared that God was already looking and searching and loving on them. But how did he involve Moses? What did he do to involve Moses? Let's look at the third reality. I have come down to rescue them, the Israelites, from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good and spacious land. This is a promised land. Therefore, go. Therefore, Moses, you go. I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. The statement is, let my people go. Let my people go. Governor Abbott, let my people go. Let my people go. And the thing about it is, if you choose not to let my people go and God is determined to make sure you let my people go, when God is determined, guess what? You can shake it as long as you want to. But sooner or later, when God gets sick and tired of getting sick and tired of being sick and tired, you don't let my people go. Yes? Mm -hmm. Sister Derrick. Yes, sir. Thank you. Number one. God was accomplishing his purpose in the world. Even though Moses was an exile in the desert, he was on God's schedule, in the fullness of God's timing. In the middle of God's will, when God was about to deliver the children from Israel, the importance factor was not God's will for Moses, but rather his will for Israel. Two. Time and again, God invited Moses to talk with him and to be with him. God initiated and maintained a growing relationship with Moses. The relationship was based on love, and God daily fulfilled his purpose through Moses. For example, uh, for example, of the love relationship, you can see Exodus 33, 7 through 34, and 10, Numbers 12, 6 through 8. God's purpose was to deliver the Israelites, God's work through Moses to accomplish his purpose. God was accomplishing his purpose in the world. You see, our world is this big. God's world is infinite. Our little world, you know, sometimes we just focus on our little thing, our little world. God, this is what I want you to do in my little world. And God does what he does in our little world, but God has a whole world that he's in charge of. God is willing to use you in accomplishing his will in the whole world. Where are you in God's utilizing you? to accomplish his will in the whole world. Where, where is God calling you to accomplish his will? And he didn't do it because Moses was living in a penthouse. The Bible says that Moses was an exile in a desert. It doesn't matter where you're located. God knows where you are, and he doesn't have to use GPS to find you out. God knows when you are, and God has his own schedule. How I many of you can witness that God got his own schedule? He has his own time, his own schedule, and God will schedule you in whenever God wants to. 
That's why the senior saint says, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. And so if he's always on time, then God has perfect timing and he does not deal with our time. It is our responsibility to create a loving relationship and meet God where he's loving us. And then leave it to God to do the rest. In the fullness of time, God has perfect time. In the fullness of time, God calls us and he initiates our mission. He initiates an ongoing loving relationship with us. God's purpose was to deliver the Israelites Sometimes we, we paint God in the corner to be a small God. And we think God's purpose is to deal with our stuff and our stuff only. He is such an awesome God that he's able to deal with our stuff and the whole world's stuff all at one time. But here in the text, God's purpose was to deliver the Israelites. And he uses Moses to accomplish his purpose. Last paragraph, page 23. Last paragraph, page 23. Whenever God prepares to do something, he reveals to a person or his people what he's going to do. Amos 3, 7 says, Indeed, the Lord God does nothing without revealing his counsel to his servants, the prophets. God accomplishes his work through his People, this is the way God will work with you. The Bible is designed to help you understand God's ways. Then when God starts to act the same way in your life, you will recognize that it is he who is working. Amen. Amen. Look what it says. The book of Amos, Amos 3 and 7. Indeed, the Lord God does nothing without revealing his counsel to his servants and his prophets. Whenever God prepares something, he prepares it and he reveals it to people. He, re he reveals, reveals it to his people. He reveals it to his servants. Whenever God is about to do something, he, he gives us a vision of it. He tells us about it. He shows us what he's doing. And I'll be the first to testify that, Lord, I ask God sometimes, Lord, what are you doing? Lord, I can't see it, but I trust you. Lord, I have never, I have never seen it done this way, but I trust what you're doing. I have to trust God even, somebody said, I have to trust him when I can't track him. I have to trust him when I can't see him. I have to believe what God is doing is for my good and the good of the whole world. In 2016, I just couldn't see. But I believe God is doing something even today. Let me tell you, the night of 2016, I, after this November, I couldn't see it. Like, God, how you let that come through here? Well, how you let that happen? But I have to trust him regardless of who is the king on the throne. I got to trust him. I got to believe that God is doing something and it's my responsibility to enjoy this loving, continual relationship with God so much so until I trust him regardless of what happens. The question is, will you trust him? Will you trust him even when it doesn't make sense? Burning bush does not consume, doesn't make sense. Using a murderer called Moses, doesn't make sense. Telling Moses to go somewhere and he can't even talk and go and speak. And God was so merciful, I'll send your brother with you. He'll interpret for you. He'll speak for you. A guy that I grew up with, the pastors in, in Jackson, Mississippi. Growing up, he studied, he studied way more than I did. He couldn't get two words out. 
And every now and then he still stutters when he speaks. But now he's a bishop of a mega church. And when he preaches, he preaches without stuttering at all. When he comes out of the pulpit, goes back to doing his thing, a stutter. <laughs> Let me tell you, God uses you when you don't have the ability to use yourself. So this pastor, this bishop, he's able to speak the word powerfully with conviction and people respond well even though he was not qualified to just stand and be a public speaker but he's an awesome preacher amazing God does miracles right before our eyes when people say we can when people count you out God counts you in that's what he did with Jesus. People counted Jesus out. People counted us out. But when Jesus died on Calvary, he gave us another chance. Not because we deserved it. Not because we were so spiritual. Jesus gave us another chance because of God's amazing grace. And he's given us another chance tonight. The door of the church is open. The door is open. You gotta trust Jesus as your personal savior. God has given somebody tonight another chance. Another chance to get it right. Another chance to be blessed of God. God has given us another chance just to involve ourselves with where he is already at work. God has given us another chance to, to slow down long enough so he can love on us with this pursuing, loving relationship. God has given us another chance because he has invited us as he, is, he has invited Moses to join him where he's at work. And it's all for God's glory, all for God's purpose, all for God's kingdom. The door of the church is open. If you never received Jesus as your Savior, this is your moment, this is your opportunity to get to know Jesus. If you can just believe this simple story that over 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary, Jesus died for you and he died for me. If you can believe the story that over 2,000 years ago he died on the cross, they laid him in a dark tomb. And early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. You can receive Jesus as your personal Savior right now. If you would bow your head with me and invite Jesus into your life, just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, you are now born again. And that when you leave here, you're on your way to heaven. Inbox us and let us know that you receive Christ as your Savior. If you want to join a good Bible teaching church, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain, where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. Please let us know. We thank God for who he is and what he's already done. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. We thank God for who he is. It is offering time. It is time to give through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is offering time. If you want to give electronically, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting. 
lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Azel is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can mail it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Please be advised that on Sunday we will be in church at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. We'll be here also at 10:30 a.m. for worship service. During that worship service, we will be commissioning our missionaries that are going on our domestic mission trip. We'll be commissioning them and praying for them as they travel, praying for them that they will reach souls for Jesus Christ. So all of you who are traveling for the mission trip, please attend on Sunday, Sunday and look forward to being commissioned to go out and win souls for Jesus Christ. We'll also have communion Sunday. We'll have communion where we will fellowship and break bread one to the other. Are there praise reports or prayer requests? Any praise reports, prayer requests? Sister Darrington, what's the name of your, your apartment complex? Zali Skills. Again? Zali Skills Apartment. Zali Skills. We're lifting up Zali Skills Apartment. We're lifting that apartment before the Lord. Uh, we're praying for the residents. We're praying for the family members. Just pray for Raynetta Weber. Raynetta Wilbert. Weber, Raynetta, who's right now? Can you write that down for me, please? Raynetta Wilbert. Raynetta. Weber. Raynetta Weber. We're praying for the Sister Darrington's apartment. If you want to give to our mission trip, you can still do that. Please let us know that, that you will want to give. Let us stand to be dismissed. Eternal God in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, we honor you, we praise you. God, we thank you for who you are, for what you do. God, we thank you, Lord, that you are calling us, that you've gotten our attention. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you are doing unique things with us. Bless our lives and bless us to be about your business. Now we come lifting up Sister Darrington's apartment complex. We ask you to intervene to, to bless in the name of Jesus. We ask you, Father God, to heal, to deliver. We ask you, God, to make your presence known. Lord, we ask you to give that apartment health, give them strength, give them hope. We ask you, Father God, to keep the devil at bay. Bless, Father God, that your spirit will rule and super rule. Lord, we pray for the Webbers. We pray for their family. We pray, Father God, that you bless them and keep them. Lord, we ask you, Father God, that you do things that, that will amaze them, amaze the doctors, amaze the family members. That men, women, boys, and girls can see that you're pursuing a loving relationship with them. That you, Father God, are looking for them. And that you are willing to bless them. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. God bless you and God keep you. Next week we will start with um, week after next we will start with um, day, five, day five page 24 week next week we will start with next week we will start with uh, day five we'll start with day five and we will cover realities four, five, six and seven as far as we can get. Amen. So the key, key chapters 
the key um, scriptures that we will be be looking at on on next week will be will be will be will be Numbers chapter twelve. Numbers chapter twelve. Numbers chapter twelve and Exodus chapter three. Numbers chapter twelve and Exodus chapter three. God bless you and keep you. Is our prayer.